There we are. Hello, everybody. I'm just sitting on a cushion to make myself a bit higher. <laughs> Here we are again Thursday, and it is the infant feeding team again, and we are on level seven and looking out at the lovely view as usual and uh, all is peaceful here we've had a busy morning and this is our questions and answers session so anything at all to do with infant feeding i'm naomi this is alex part of the team there's uh, four or five of us one's on maternity leave that's why i'm uh, unsure about that um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, we are loving our questions every week and hopefully uh, making a difference to some of you uh, in supporting you and your, the way that you're feeding your baby so um, this is infant feeding, it's not breastfeeding, so if you've got any questions at all about feeding, uh, we want to know about them. So that could be formula or breast milk or breastfeeding or weaning or yep. anything anything in between yep. at all. So if you're worried about anything to do with feeding, then um, this is the place to come. And uh, we don't want to talk about uh, scans and water births and um, packing bags and things because uh, that's not really the forum here. And we do know about it, but we're not the best people to ask because we don't work in those areas at the moment. So, uh, you know, you're better asking somebody who does know the right answer and things like visiting. Uh, although you can find all of those visiting things on the uh, website for the trust. So if you go into the JR website, you can get that sort of information if you need it. Um, and um, some of you might be watching. We've got just a couple coming up, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, some of you might be watching this uh, in the middle of the night when you're feeding your babies, uh, which is what we get told quite a lot, that uh, they don't get to see us live, but they do it when they are feeding in the night. Yeah. So, um, and they they all say they find them really useful, so I hope you do find them useful. We thoroughly enjoy uh, doing these sessions because, um, you know, we get such brilliant questions every time we do them, and it's, you know, it just makes us think about what's happening in the hospital as well, because you are our feedback. Uh, and you know we get we get um, an idea of what's going on. So it's been a bit better in the last few weeks. It hasn't been quite so hectic as it, it was in October. I think we had many many births one day, and um, not many births another day in October. But uh, I think that was the start of. I think we had ten one day in the stats that I saw um, at the end of October. So uh, that was the sort of start of our quieter area. So um, I think it's just steady now. So hopefully you're getting the support you need uh, in the hospital and uh, support in the communities that you need. I think the breastfeeding help is really improving, isn't yeah, it? I um, think since lockdown, it's sort of things are gradually opening, so you're getting more face-to-face -face in the community now as well. And, and the I fact that all our midwives come through um, baby-friendly accredited universities yeah. makes a really big difference as well. So you know, there, you may be meeting newly qualified midwives, but they've got fabulous skills. Yeah. They've been so well trained. Um, the university here in Oxford, the Oxford Brookes University, is a BFI accredited, accredited university, which means that they're taught to a particular standard, the standard that we're working towards. And as are many of the other universities that are running midwifery programs now. So we know the, the calibre of our midwives is superb. So mm. that's really good and that really helps when they're, they're all the new midwives are coming through this this process. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the things that we do get lots of mums saying when they feed back to us that they, they get a lot of conflicting advice. And I think we've talked about this uh, several times over the yeah. last few weeks because they're saying that somebody says something different every day to them. But, you know, your baby's needs change every day. And from day naught, where we say, you know, maybe three feeds in the first uh, 24 hours uh, with lots of hand expressing in between but you know your baby's needs are only at, at you know minimum three if they want to do 10 that's absolutely fine and some babies do just come and plug in um, and just feed 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 and don't stop till the milk arrives uh, but it's more likely to arrive quickly if you if your baby goes to the breast or you stimulate your breast frequently than if you don't do very much it's much less likely to arrive when you want it to um, but uh, you know their needs are very different. So the next day we'd say maybe feed your baby five times. And you know, it is very small amounts and we, you know, we're gonna go back to our syringes and our stomach sizes here because um, that's exactly what it is. I can't find any. Um, I haven't been tidying it up. No, I've been untidying it because we did some training this week, didn't we? Mm. So I'm looking for a syringe to show you so that you can see the volumes because that really is so important that um, you understand that volumes are not huge and that you don't fill a bottle. So this is, you know, this is a syringe that we would say, and in the early days, this is a one mil syringe and it's got sort of little notches on it. 
uh, and each notch is point a point of a mill. So point one of a mill is not unheard of on the, the first day when you're hand expressing that that's what you get. And then, you know, gradually over the days, um, in the 48 hours, the volumes will go up. I mean, some people will fill a syringe and some people will get tiny amounts and it's varying on your technique and it's varying on um, your breasts and, and it's all normal. And if you just breastfed, you wouldn't know if your baby had had enough or not. So um, I'm just looking for, tummy si uh, for a tummy size picture. Are you ready? No, <laughs> but I know it's here because I have seen it and I saw it on... Um, I think the thing is to believe that it's going to increase the volumes of milk you're producing. We regularly see people who produce tiny weeny amounts on the first day, just a glimmer, and then within no time at all, with good stimulation, they're producing yeah. really good volumes. Yeah, so you know, you can see this as a cherry size, and that uh, correlates really well with the size of the syringe. So, you know, we do talk about tiny volumes on your first day, and on the second day, we talk about tiny volumes. So that's your baby's day one. So day naught is your baby's birthday. Day one is your um, is is the next day, not day two. So um, that's still tiny volumes, but the volume should be more. The the number of times you feed should be going up a little bit. So maybe five times in 24 hours. You can do more than that, but you know it would be okay to just feed your baby five times in that time. But by day two, you should be feeding your baby eight times minimum in 24 hours, and the volume should be going up. So if you were told on day not that 0 0.1, 0, you know, 0 0.2 mils is enough, then um, that's exactly what it is. But the next day it will be going up a bit more. And then certainly by day two, the volume should be going up again. And you should be doing that yourselves. You shouldn't be waiting for somebody to tell you. So, you know, if you go home on day one and you're giving tiny little bits of food and you're still doing that on day five, your baby will have lost an awful lot of weight. So, um, and this is what we're finding, that some mums aren't increasing the volumes when they get home and they keep giving what the midwife told them on day one. And then they say their advice is conflicting because they were told only to give a small amount, but actually that was on day naught and day one. We just look at the sizes of the stomach and how much they grow. Yeah, so, you know, by, by day three, it's sort of the size of an apricot. Uh, or is that a walnut? No, it's a walnut, walnut isn't it? Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> First at one's it back a walnut. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, after a week, it's the size of an apricot, and then by uh, a month, it's the size of an egg. So it's never big. A baby's tummy is never big. A baby is little. So they don't have the capacity to, um, you know, take large volumes. And, and that it doesn't mean you have to fill those, but we do know that you have to increase the volumes. So, um, you know, we talk about peas and poos and the amount that your baby pees. Um, goes up so by day five your baby should be doing six to eight weeks in 24 hours um, and that goes up each day from day naught you know they'll do one pea maybe and then two one to two peas then two to three peas then you know three to four and then up to to five six seven eight peas by day five when the volumes have gone up so your breasts are um, have colostrum in the first few days and then as your milk comes in when you've delivered your placenta the messages get to your brain to stop producing milk and that happens after about 48 hours and so the volumes in your breasts go up so your baby's expecting to get more volumes each day because that's what happens in your breast when they're suckling so if you're not getting your baby attached to the breast you still need to increase those volumes absolutely you get have got to increase expressing. those volumes and yes you hand express until you you know probably 48 hours and then you can start using a pump if it's easier because mm. you'll probably get um you know, larger volumes out if you do that and you'll start to see more milk and your breasts will start to feel warm and veiny and a little bit heavier and so that's telling you that your milk the blood is rushing to your breast to make more milk so um it st all starts the production going with the hormones so you know you should know as a mother that that's what you should do you shouldn't be sitting there and giving the same as you were doing on day two you should be thinking ah oh, but my baby's needs are changing i yep. need to be increasing the volumes and and off to a best start, the book that you get to take home with you does tell you that. Well, hopefully you'll pick it up at your 36-week scan appointment. And yeah. I think, you know, we know that the majority of women will come for a scan appointment, which is why we've asked for it to be handed out at that point. So you have it before you've That's had your fine. baby, which is really handy because it gives you an opportunity when you're not as tired and you're not, um, you know, so if you haven't got the baby there already to have a good look at it. And there's a fantastic page on page 17 all about the, what the, you know, the poos and wees that we've just been talking about, what we're aiming for, that, that change that is going to happen. This one so, here. 
talking about that change from black sticky meconium that's so I mean so sticky to the bottom there's no way you can get it off with cotton wool and water and that's what we ask you to do um, and then it goes to the sort of more dilute meconium because the baby's now getting milk and colostrum is a, as a food in concentrate but it is also a laxative and so what you're then finding is it becomes much much easier to get off the bottom and it does come off with cotton wool and water um, and then when, by the time we get to day four, and we've said this many a time, we said all the time, we want those poos to be yellow. Yellow poos on day four is the most reassuring thing you can see. And you know then the baby's getting enough food. And babies are not constipated. It does not happen. If a baby's being breastfed, they will not be constipated. If your baby is not pooing, then they are not getting enough food. It is as simple as that. This is, the, this is your booklet that you take home with you and it's got all the details of phone numbers and things on it but this is also for you as parents the midwives look at it too but this is for you as parents and pre 72 hours so the first day or two this should be filled in and, and if you're ticking on the green side then everything's fine but if you've got tick boxes on there saying no he's not really peeing very much and no I'm not able to feed him um, you know then you should be calling somebody to get help and then this is after 72 hours for five days and it should be done probably most days by parents just to double check that they're on track um, and it talks about volumes and increasing volumes which is you know crucial to your baby's needs to keep their um, kidneys functioning and to uh, get rid of you know the, the once they've got rid of meconium to them to accept the food and to give them calories because you know they don't sustain the what we call counter regulation after about two days where they burn fat if they're not getting many calories and, and that very low high calorie low volume high calorie colostrum changes to milk and so they they do need to have more food and you know you think about when you're at home and you're having your food how many times do you put something to your lips every day and it's probably about 16 to 20. you know you don't just have it when you're hungry so don't expect your babies not to have frequent feeds as well because um, you know they do need to be fed frequently and, and they don't you know if you've had a biscuit and a yogurt and an apple and a banana and a piece of cake in the time between your baby's feeds just think that they may want to feed a bit more quickly than three hours and they may wake up and want that so don't expect them to do it to the clock they'll do it to what they feel and it might be that they're bored it might be that they're lonely it might be that they are hungry uh, they just might want cuddles and to be close to you you know it's more than just food so um, the volumes and uh, feed should be frequent and uh, you know given un what, what's the word I'm thinking of whatever volume they want yeah that's what let I'm them saying. regulate their own flow that's what I'm trying to say and <laughs> um, we've got two comments on here I'm just going to reply to the first one quickly just in case anyone else is seeking to say uh, Maxine has said not sure if we're allowed to ask questions yes please Please. Yes, that's what it's <laughs> we all about. Really, we really don't want to be having to just fill the whole time. So yes, please <laughs> get questions. All the time well, we will like be that. talking because we we'll be. we'll be answering them. But but actually, no. It's it, it, the whole idea of this is it's a question and answer session. So yeah. please, please do just that. So to you. Yeah. So I'll just um I'll just go Fire to the away, first please. go to the first one and then move on to Maxine's question. Um. So Charlotte has said she's one of our, our top fan is Charlotte. Um, she has said, um, hi ladies, hope you're both well and keeping safe. Alicia's playing with her toys at the moment and we got back from Banbury in time to watch this chat. Lovely. So we'll wave at Alicia, we always do. Hello. Uh, um, <laughs> Maxine has said, asked if she could ask a question, which is yes, please do ask questions. Um, she said she never had full breasts, could never hand express, never felt any flow come through. Um, her midwife helped her antenatally, but to no avail. Is there anything I can do during pregnancy to increase my supply? I tried everything, skin on skin, when the baby was there, I was expressing probably a teaspoon from each breast after 45 minutes. During the antenatal period, there isn't really very much you can do apart from just reacquaint yourself with the skill of hand expressing. Um, so that might be worth doing is go back and see, you know, make sure you've got those skills honed before you've even had your baby. But in order to help you after the baby, which is going to have the biggest impact, it's things like uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact. I think we talked about this last week. Mm. And when we mean that, that means literally the baby is born, put on you and not moved, not taken away to be weighed, not taken away to be cleaned or cuddled by someone else or any clothes. It goes on you and stays on you until after the first feed. That first hour, hour and a bit of skin-to-skin -skin contact 
is absolutely crucial. It's a time when the baby is being primed. They're learning all about your breasts. They've never messed the breasts before. Your breasts are what are going to be their norm. Um, and it brings out their breast seeking and breastfeeding behavior as well as it helps them have that change and um, adapt to extra uterine life, i.e. being born. So they are going to be able to regulate their heart rate, their temperature and their breathing because they're against you. They're learning about your smell, which is so important. As, a, as we were training this morning, as Naomi mentioned, and uh, one of the things that I would say is that, you know, all other animals can identify their parents by the smell. Well, we're no different. Our babies know our individual smells. So that's part of it too. And it just sets babies up for a really, really good start. And that's whether they're being breastfed or not breastfed. Skin to skin in that first hour and a bit after birth is crucial for all babies. It also um, coats the baby in the, baby in the mother's skin flora. So we all have our individual skin floras. Mine will, will be different from Naomi's, but probably, probably pretty similar to my other halves. Then what we want is our baby to have our skin flora on, it, on, their baby, on our babies because that protects them. I described it this morning like a ready breath glow. So it's a protective coating that means that no other, no other person's skin flora, should I touch that baby or someone else touches that baby, gets a look in because that baby's already colonized in your skin flora. So that skin to skin contact is doing lots and lots as well as helping with feeding. It's the golden hour, isn't it? It is that known as the golden one. hour, yeah. and the baby goes through nine stages, yeah. um, which it will go through regardless of what's happening. And if you, but if you move the baby and put them back again, i.e., twenty minutes later the baby's weighed and the baby goes back, it goes back to number one of nine, and it has to work its yeah. way through. And quite often, number nine, which is sleep, takes over, and the baby doesn't get the whole way through. Mm -hmm. And as number eight is feeding, they skip feeding, which is really sad because that's their priming, learning to feed. You know, we know it takes about 56 minutes for a baby to be born skin to skin and to crawl up and attach and suckle and feed at yeah. the breast and then go to sleep. That's how long it takes. So that's why they call it the golden hour. Yeah. So, um, you know, that undisturbed, uninterrupted time is so crucial because you'll never get that back. And that's the one that primes your hormones. It's the one that gives the skin to skin is the big surge to make the milk. And so, if, you know, if you had a slightly lower supply last time, it might be that you had interrupted skin to skin a little bit or, um, you know, your baby was more sleepy. And we know that if you have a cesarean, that skin to skin uh, opportunity is not as great because um, it's quite often cold in theatre. You're feeling shaky, you feel sick, you're very numb. So you feel a bit out of control and worry about dropping your baby. So, you know, it's not always the fact that we don't let it happen as, as healthcare professionals. It's the fact that you can't, um, you don't enjoy doing it at that time because you're just feeling a bit off, off normal and off kilter. And so we say do it as soon as you can after that time. But remember that that time never is to be taken back. And this know, fits, in, fits in with Maxine's next comment, that she had a section with her first emergency, having another with her second. Am I allowed to have skin on skin whilst I'm being stitched up? So on the training day today, was um, one of the maternity support workers who works on the elective section bay. And she was saying she gets everybody hand expressing before they have the baby. And then she gets them all skin to skin afterwards. So make sure it's in your birth plan. It is pretty much the norm, but as Naomi said, on occasions, it's actually maternal choice that it doesn't happen because mums can feel quite shaky. I think an elective section is a much more controlled situation and probably a lot easier, easier to facilitate than maybe in an emergency section. But if you go in with the intention of doing it, then the likelihood that it will happen. And no one's gonna put barriers in your way because it is, it is standard practice to do skin to skin as soon as possible, even in theater. And we know that mums produce less milk if they've had a cesarean because they don't get that huge surge of um, hormones with the skin to skin if they don't have uninterrupted skin to skin. And actually most births, you know, in a, in a busy maternity unit are the same because um, mums are, you know, often have got um, comorbidities, they've got, um, you know, pain relief on board, they need suturing, uh, they may have got um, things that get in the way because then they've got uh, the medical problems and things. So, you know, it, unless you're in, in your front room at home or in one of the MLUs where it's not quite so frantic and you're very low risk, and your baby is probably very low risk, then, um, you know, you'll find that actually you'll get uninterrupted skin when you're away from a hospital environment. So you have to be very 
assertive if you want to have skin to skin and uninterrupted skin to skin because um, people want to wear your baby and they want to get you sutured and they want to get you cleaned up and they want to you know get your baby dressed and and uh, ready to go up to the ward and actually you can say no I want to do lots of skin to skin I want to have this time with my baby so I can have this huge hormone surge which is not able to be chased back once it's gone it's gone um, and give your baby the chance to have a feed and if, if the feeding isn't happening because your baby's a bit sleepy then you can hand express at that time in the first hour and do some hand expressing on both the breasts in that first hour because that will have the same impact you will start the pro you know the, pro the um, way of breastfeeding I'm having real trouble with my words today <laughs> Alex um, with the process that's the word I'm thinking of uh, of uh, stimulating uh, milk to start being produced I think the fact that you're asking the questions, Maxine, means that actually, you know, yeah. you're going to go in it with your into it with your eyes open. Yeah. And Naomi mentioned about the impact of having a section. It often results in a slightly in a delay of mum's milk coming in because they've had delayed skin to skin. Just try and do as much as yeah. you can and get hand expressing as quick as you can. As um, soon you as know, you can, yeah. Right. So you know, if you struggled with milk supply last time, we would go belt and braces. Literally, my daughter was saying, "What does that mean? That means just just doing everything." you can mm -hmm. uh, so that would be feeding and hand expressing because we want to leave no opportunity on part you know on taken out I can't talk even that and um, you know <laughs> left behind we want to take every opportunity going now we've talked about it on these sessions before there are reasons why people can be predisposed to not produce quite so much milk mm -hmm. and it more than sections so we know that some mothers who maybe have something like polycystic ovary syndrome or hypothyroidism um, maybe some forms of fertility treatment um, and we know diabetes can put you on the back foot too so any chest or breast surgery that may have affected that nerve that's you know innovating your nipple and areola which is really important all these sort of things can impact on a supply mm -hmm. and it's better we know about them before you have your baby so we can put plans in place than afterwards and you're three days down the line and we've missed three really good days of fish and your milk supply now that's the thing about it is that you, there is no time to rest when it comes to if you're going if there is a chance you're going to be struggling to get your milk supply up it's being totally proactive from the minute your baby is born mm -hmm. And, you know, and hand expressing within the first hour and telling the body the baby is here and we need this milk and we need more and more and more. You can sleep later in yeah. two weeks time. And it's awful. <laughs> I feel so cruel. I was, as I say, we were doing the training today and I said to this, because we had quite a lot of MSWs who were working on delivery suite and electric section bear places. And I said, and I know mothers will say they're so tired and they are tired, mm -hmm. but actually the, the, the way that your the process, as Naomi described, the process of milk production it's, it has to happen regardless of how you're feeding and it's that milk production needs to be really pushed and then once you've got that thing yeah. under your belt you're and you do you know go. in our clinic we see many women that have no milk and that's that's our bread and butter because women that have milk don't come and see us usually unless they've got something specific going on but um you know generally if you've got milk the feeding will take care of itself and uh, you can get food into your baby so your baby gains weight and it poos and pees and everybody's happy uh, even if it's not suckling at the breast it's something that you can work on um, once you're you know once you've got yourself sorted but you've got milk you can do anything so you know no milk is a cause of huge heartache for many many mums and they come back into hospital because they've got no milk and you've got a window you know two weeks and, and if that is not achieved because you haven't done much stimulation for one reason or another you've not been well or um, you've just been too tired to do it and your baby's been getting top-ups of extra food so you might have got donor breast milk in the ward or uh, you might have chosen to give formula to your babies every time you do that you're reducing the chances of your babies uh, touching at the breast and suckling because they are sleeping um, and have been fed uh, other foods and that then reduces the stimulation further so it reduces your milk production further and that window is about two weeks so um, that's why I said tongue in cheek that you can sleep in two weeks time because you'll have made your milk by then. Uh, but um, you know, it's really, really crucial that that happens and that you don't end up coming back in. And babies are often jaundiced uh, at the same time because they're a little bit dehydrated if the milk production is lower. Um, and also because they're, if they're not getting much colostrum or food, they don't poo very much. And the meconium then sits inside their tummy, inside their guts and that makes your baby more jaundiced as well. So, you know, the colostrum is there as a laxative, 
it makes your baby poo lots, so the more colostrum they get, the more they poo, the more the meconium leaves their body, the less likely they are to be jaundiced, and the more likely you are to make milk. So your baby then starts to feed well, and then you, you don't have problems. Now, obviously, if your baby's a little bit premature, or you've had a forceps delivery or something, there is a more increased risk of having a jaundiced baby because they are slightly more immature, they've got a little bit of bruising or whatever, um, then that could impact the um, jaundice. But generally, physiological jaundice is managed with food and uh, colostrum and breast milk. And the breast milk attaches to the jaundice in the gut and it's and in, in the bloodstream as well. And it removes all the uh, bilirubin from the baby and the baby poos it all out. So the more breast milk they get, the more the jaundice goes. Right, Maxine's got a bit more coming, but we'll get more carry on to her in a second. So Alicia's just saying, um, Charlotte's saying that Alicia's waving at us and trying to talk to us. Uh, she wants to know if, they, if you're allowed to give um, toddlers warm decaf tea. Good question, I don't know. I remember when I lived in Holland, the children from four would have tea. I it don't has know. got caffeine in it, so I don't well, know. I mean, decaf. Decaf, yeah. yeah, or you can give fruit teas to them. Um, but some people do. Absolutely, very milky, a warm drink, but there's other drinks as well you can give. Yeah. Um, Maxine's carried on, said, um, I definitely said I didn't want her on me because I felt so awkward and just wanted them to take her yeah. to make sure she was That's okay. Exactly Thanks what we so mean. much. That surge in yeah. that first hour is enormous. And yeah. uh, when you hand express on one side or feed on one side, we see the mums in the community uh, day five, day six, and they say, oh, I've got much more milk in my left breast than my right breast. That would be because they fed in the first hour yeah. on that side. Yeah. And this side, the production's down because they didn't stimulate that side in the first hour. It makes such a huge difference in the milk production. So some of you will think back to that and say, oh yes, because actually that's what happens. You get this huge surge of uh, hormones, which then stimulates milk production. So if you feed on one breast only in the first hour, you'll find that that side has probably got more milk in it. So you could also, also do fund expressing that at the same time, uh, so that you've got a little bit of colostrum as well, because that will have a massive impact on both breasts in production. Charlie has said, will all midwives allow you to have long skin to skin and not weigh or do, or do their checks? Or is it only some midwives? I think it's very much a case of what's happening on the day, Charlie. I mean, mm. the midwives are all aware of the importance of uninterrupted skin to skin. They, they, they know well, it. The they know it. Labor, don't yeah, it's known as the fourth stage of labour. Make sure it's stated on your birth plan that that's what you want. And what I would say, the caveat on it is that if delivery suite's really busy, which it does happen, and I, you know, in the last couple of months we've been unbelievably busy. I don't yeah. believe that there's a dip in the birth rate from what we've seen. Anyway. Certainly not in Oxford. I think everybody's come to have their babies here, um, but it has been really busy. Um, if it, if it is busy, and that's a conversation you have with your midwife or your partner has with your midwife, if you're not up to it then make an agreement that your baby is weighed as early as possible. Mm. So maybe they're born, they put on you, they go out, get the scales and get the, you know, get the baby weighed as quickly as possible. Because what we want from then on is this uninterrupted skin to skin. So we do know, because what the midwives have to do is they have to put through a form called an NN4B. Mm. And on the NN4B, it needs the baby's weight. And that's why there's a push to get the weight um, you know, at some point. And the reason I say if it's busy, so if there's a likelihood your midwife is going to be going to need to go and look after somebody else before you know you've you've been through the whole process of feeding, etc., then they're going to be encouraged to do their NN4B and they'll want the weight. So it's worth having a discussion um, and finding out how busy is delivery suite. If it's not busy, then you don't need to worry because they can leave you um, and they can wait after you've fed. But if it is busy, it's worth doing it as early as possible and then putting your baby back skin to skin so that they can go through those nine stages and make it to the end without falling asleep. So that's why we suggest it. And it, it you know, it's your, you have the power to put it on your birth plan. I want uninterrupted skin to skin. And I want to then follow that mm, unless it's and medically I, not indicated. And I want, I want my baby and your partner needs to be there to support you as well. I want my baby to go through their nine stages, but come to an agreement with your midwife because you know if, she, if they are really busy, then she can weigh early, and if they're not really busy, they can weigh after you fed. Mm. So they find find a, find a, an agreement with them because you don't get that time back. You know, once it's gone, it's gone, and that's and I think you don't realise that till 
you come back and have another baby, you know, as, as you've already had uh, the discussion, as, you know, just yeah. Maxine said that, you know, she didn't have the skin to skin and now she knows that that's, you know, the reason why, you know, it's, it's then you're, you're more proactive the next time. But, you know, you shouldn't have to do that to get to your next baby, to, to get that skin to skin and have that plan in place. Mm. You should do it with your first as well, because it's so crucial to your um, milk production and your baby's uh, development. And we know that um, you know all the transference of all the flora and everything is crucial to a baby's um, health, and and actually skin to skin in the first hour determines your baby's health at, at 75. So it determines their you know obesity, diabetes, heart disease, um, all the other things that determine health uh, in older people. That first hour determines your your health as an adult, as an older adult, in that first hour. So that's that's why it's so important. It protects you for life. It's it's the start of a lifelong journey of, of optimum health, and so um, you know we do we do support it hugely. And, and actually, most health healthcare professionals will that work in this world. It's just that procedures sometimes get in the way and uh, time constraints get quite blurred. So um, I think it you know if it comes from you as parents, then they you know it stops them. From, uh, you know, that makes them go back to the, the basics and say, okay, let's do some skin to skin. We'll keep your baby with you. Um, right, that was Charlie's question. Maxine has said, oh, what is the clinic you talk about? Is it somewhere we can come to, for help postpartum? So it, it's a clinic that we run two, two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays. It's for babies of seven days up to six weeks. Um, give us a call if you think you would, you would benefit from it. We'll have a chat yeah. with you. Um, to be honest, we're here for the more complex problems. So we tend to see the babies that are not gaining weight, but the mums that are not producing enough milk. Um, babies that have got suckling problems. Yeah, babies that don't go on at all um, after a few days. In the first instance, your help is from your community midwives. Mm -hmm. So your community midwives are all trained to help with feeding. Everybody has training. So I've, we're so busy trying to catch up post COVID with training that we've done a three lots of training this week, mm -hmm. haven't we? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it is going on all the time in the hospital. So they are being updated regularly and they are, as I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, many of our new starters are coming from baby friendly accredited universities, which means they have very, very good skills. So they have got the skills to help with the day to day help, you know, that you need for feeding. We're here for that little next step up where th that hasn't worked and you need a bit more. You're very welcome to give us a call. We'll have a chat with you if we think, yeah, if we think you can be helped by your community midwives, we will send you back to them. Um, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support is a really good place to go as well. They do fabulous work. Abingdon Baby Cafe and the La Leche League are all great places to get help from. And we're here for that that next bit, you know, one to one, one hour, full on appointment. Let's see what we can do to try and sort your problems. Anyway. And we do, we are present on the wards, but hopefully we won't see any of you. Yeah. Because actually we, we're not here just to see if your baby's not attaching at the breast, we, you won't be expected to see us. Um, and, uh, you know, if you ask, you probably, we probably say, no, it's not appropriate. We want to see mums that are having uh, clinical issues that have got medications or that are, um, have got, uh, you know, comorbidities that will benefit from our input in the early days on milk production more than just doing, um, you know, the stuff that we talk about on here, which is, uh, you know, stimulations eight times a day, so skin to skin and hand expressing. And, and so the advice that we will give back to the midwife in your care is that um, you would do hand expressing and keep giving your baby um, express colostrum in the early days and do lots and lots of skin to skin, because uh, what will happen is that your baby will then uh, go on to feed. And, and quite often on the wards, you know, these babies are quite sleepy. If you've had an epidural, your baby will be affected by that in the first day or two. It will be quite sleepy. The fentanyl in the uh, epidural that you have is uh, quite a strong opiate and it does have an impact on your baby's um, crawling and feeding and waking up. And so, you know, you're tired, your baby's tired and you've both been medicated. Uh, your baby will be a bit sleepy. So it's really important that you do that production and uh, just keep giving your baby the colostrum to get rid of the meconium and to stimulate your breast to produce milk. And then what will happen is your baby will start to wake up and um, it will have pooed the meconium out so its tummy will start to feel more empty and, and then it'll start to play out the feeding cues. So, you know, it's up to you to just keep doing that and that will be the answer and, and they will come back to you and say, 
actually you need to do skin to skin and hand expressing on the ward because that's what, what you should be doing. Um, and hopefully your baby will wake up and feed uh, in the time you're at the ward, but not always. But it's not, it's not generally something we would deal with on the wards. We've seen mums that have had you know, treatments for illnesses or have got um, problems where they you know, really need to be supported in a much more um, uh, prescriptive way. So, you know, in the best possible way, we don't want to see you um, because uh, <laughs> if we don't, it means that you're normal and you don't need to get involved, we don't need to get involved in your care because the midwives and the care assistants on the ward are generally, you know, very, very um, well trained to support you in your breastfeeding. And that goes back to what we said at the beginning where you get conflicting advice and somebody tells you something different every day on the wards and your midwives at home tell you different, but that's because your baby's needs are changing every day as we talked about earlier. So we don't want to see you. Right, kind of flurry of questions, <laughs> does help when you uh, refresh the page. I could see them coming up on the screen, <laughs> but not coming up on here, so I've, I've redone it. Anyway, so Stephanie has asked, hello, is it normal for an eight week old baby to drink 14 ounces of milk in two hours during the night? Now I've been sitting here doing my mental maths, that's where I need my husband. 14 ounces, I know. 14 ounces is, uh, is over 400 mils. So that's pretty much half a daily intake. Yeah. So your baby's taking half the daily intake over that period. Um, I mean, we believe in responsive feeding. So if that's what the baby's asking for, I would assume that they probably would take slightly less at other times. Um, but it's remembering, um, if you, I mean, obviously you know how much your baby's getting. So it would suggest that, um, that it's being given by a bottle. So just thinking about responsive bottle feeding, thinking, I don't know if you've got, we can quickly demonstrate responsive bottle feeding. So it's thinking about um, allowing the baby to regulate their own intake by making sure that the bottle is not upright. We don't want flat babies and upright bottles. We actually want not like that. Yes, we want upright babies and flat bottles. So you just fill this little bit here. Um, can you see that on the teat? You just fill that, so you don't need to fill the teat up and make sure that it's that, because if you, filled a bottle up like this and did that, it would just trip, 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 all the time. It would just be pouring out. Whereas if you turn it like that and just fill this bit up, um, it's much calmer. So, um, you know, it's just managing that and letting your baby take what they want. Um, but you quite be seen, actually, man. And it, can you not see? I stand up and bend my legs. You're a bit smaller than me. I look like it. Yeah. You're a bit smaller than me. No, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's having a baby upright in close and that's really important then we talk a lot about on, on these sessions about brain growth your baby's brain is being fertilized mm. every time you chat to them love them stroke them cuddle them kiss them sing to them and having them in close is really important it's being bathed in oxytocin oxytocin is the brain fertilizer you cannot love your babies too much you cannot cuddle them too much don't let anyone tell you, you can so just because they may be having a bottle does not mean they want to be over here. They want to be here. You're going to brush down the lips to encourage a gape. And if you're one of these mothers who at the moment is having is mixed feeding, so they might be doing some bottles and some breasts, this really helps reinforce um, the, the fact that the baby needs to open their mouth for the breast. So brushing down reminds them that they need to open their mouth. It's also nice to be told you're going to be fed rather than having anything thrust into your mouth. And once the baby's mouth is open, you're going to introduce the bottle, as Naomi said, horizontally, so that this bit that's in the baby's mouth is full. We don't need the whole bottle. As there's less and less, you will have to go up. But if there's lots in there and you do this, they're going to get drip, 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 and the babies can't keep up, they can't control the flow, and they will take far too much. So that, was, that would be my one thing to think about, um, Stephanie, is how are you feeding that milk? Maybe try a slightly more responsive way of feeding and you might find your baby takes slightly less. It does seem quite a lot. And how many feeds in that uh, time? Is it between seven and seven that you're talking about? Cause that, you know, that's no, it's two hours. In two, two, oh, two, two hours. hours, yes. She said lot, 14 yeah. ounces of milk in two yeah, hours. That's quite a lot. Yeah, so. Yeah, and perhaps have tummy ache afterwards, yeah. But it's an eight week old baby, it's a quite big baby, but even then. So that, that, yeah. does, does your baby take that amount in the daytime in, in one go as well? Yeah. Uh, over two hours, or is it just at night that you're giving those volumes? Can you swap it around a little bit so they have a bit more in the day? To see if they're not quite so hungry? Yeah. 
I have a think and see. Talk health to a health sister. Yeah, health yeah. sister. That's where yeah. I was going to. So your health sister. So very good at things like that. Talking about what you know, what to do in the yeah in the daytime. Be really good to have a chat with your health yeah. sister about yeah. it. Yeah. It does seem quite a bit though. Maxine's come back. Sorry, so many questions. I have thrombocyt thrombocytopenia, and if my papers drop too low on admission, I need to be put under general for my section. Can I still do skin on skin if that's the case, if my husband can help? Yes, set him up to do it. Um, have Again, him. put it in your birth plan, yeah. tell him what he needs to do. He needs to be ensuring your baby has got you know, a nice open airway um, and the baby can still be skin to skin. You, you know, your baby could attach even if you're asleep, you know, or still out of it. Um, so absolutely. Um, and you no, know, we wouldn't worry on that one. Yeah, okay. it's more difficult and you'll have very little memory of it probably yeah. because uh, but you know you have very light general anaesthetic get your partner to take a picture because um yeah. it's a, i cannot tell you how many mums we meet who do not remember the first few hours after birth so get a picture it would be nice because then you'll be able to see it and know that it happened picture of the weight oh yes photograph picture the weight you with yeah. your baby if you've had yeah. something like a general or you know you do get very amnesic and and if you've had any medication at all you are very amnesic and it, and it's it is almost deliberate that you're amnesic when you give birth because you sort of forget the the um you know the impact of it because it's you know it is uh, quite a powerful experience as you know and uh it makes you you don't often remember a lot of it you're sort of into into sort of um another world when you're giving birth and and so time goes very differently and so you know it is nice to have those memories uh, and being prodded and having a partner with you is great for that reason um right but i've scanned the next one I actually I, this this gives this will give so many so much hope to so many people so susan has written my baby boy is nearly eight months he had expressed breast milk for the first eight weeks i then finally managed to get him to latch and he's been breastfed, breastfed ever since. Uh, but it won't, he won't take a bottle. Is it worth trying at eight months to introduce him again to a bottle or not? Just as an option, other than being with, with him 24 hours, I will still breastfeed his mil main milk supply. Well, first off, I just want to say, Susan, thank you for putting that question up because I think people do begin to despair. And we yeah. get, it's like Naomi's just mentioned about babies, you know, if, you, if we're told that you're on the ward and your baby's not attaching in your day two, then we can't do anything. Yeah. You, you can only do lots and lots of skin to skin, keep your baby close yeah. and do those things. And that's just proof that babies can sometimes take time to learn. And we're always saying, get your milk supply established and then your baby's got time to learn and your baby did it. And how wonderful is that? But now I do get it, but <laughs> you can't get them to take a bottle. How about a cup? That's what we we'll always say. Don't Straw. worry about a bottle. Feed a beaker. Yes, you use straws with yours, I use straws with mm. mine and they learnt to uh, drink through a straw. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't have to be a bottle. I think, you know, it's it's there's no reason to get off the breast and put your baby onto a bottle at eight months mm. uh, or six months even. You know, there's no need to do that or even a year. Some people wean their babies off the breast and then give them a bottle at night. Uh, Don't need to. There doesn't need to do Cups. that at all. Just you a cup is cup. fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Go and have a look and see what there are out there. Doidy cups, we've mentioned a few yeah. times. There are all sorts of different soft top cups. Yeah. There's so many different, so I wouldn't worry about a bottle. Ones. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, they will yeah. They will take what they like, you know, and, and some of those sort of doorstop wedge tops are quite nice, especially if they're teething, because they like to really pull on them and they're quite firm. So, um, you know, just, just experiment. It'll cost you a bit, but, you know, experiment and see what other mums are doing as well. Uh, because there'll be somebody that's done it already and had that experience. So, but it's isn't it fab fabulous. What yeah, you've done. well done. And that's why I said that you'd be that will be so heartening yeah. for people who might be listening, who are struggling to get their babies to feed. It's brilliant. I news. think the um, the longest for me was somebody rang up and said at nine months that their baby took their first breastfeed. <laughs> they'd never breastfed at all, and they'd been and had support with us, and and uh, they said they took their first breastfeed at nine months. So you know they will do it if they want to. Um, but that's quite extreme. So eight weeks is fabulous. But um, yeah, they they um, they'll do it when they're ready. Claire has written. And it's, it was nice to see your name, Claire, because I haven't seen your name on here for a while. She's been asked plenty of questions in the past. Um, she said, "Hello, both. Quick question: When pregnant and breastfeeding, is it normal to have transitional milk whilst your milk changes to colostrum? I'm 14 weeks and still feeding." Um, 17 month old. Wow, is it that long since we saw you with your last baby? 
Um, still feeding 17 month old and milk looks very yellow, slightly thick. Is this normal? Many thanks. Yeah, it's going to colostrum. It changes of colostrum after yeah. about 18 weeks and it becomes yeah. really salty again and some babies will keep going and other babies uh, don't like the taste of it. So we'll have so. to see what happens, Claire. We look forward to hearing. Wait, it's fine to breastfeed so. through it all. Congra go. Congratulations on this one. Yeah, well done. Yeah. All those skills you've got for next time. Yeah. Um, Marzena has said, hello both. You may remember little preterm Amelia. Uh, we're still using shields, but doing really well. Thanks again for all your help and reassurance when, when in hospital. Congratulations. Keep Thank going. You so much we had that conversation today, today, didn't we? We yeah. had a conversation today about we're not purists about shields. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we'd much rather your baby's feeding via a shield than not feeding at all. Yeah. And pumping becomes so all consuming. Mm. You know, it's so hard to keep pumping that actually having a baby on the breast with a shield is, is I have to say, infant, I think much better for mothers. You've got a good supply and your attachment is good on the shield. It's, you know, it's as good as breastfeeding for some mums if you've got plenty of milk. It's yeah. if you've got low uh, milk supply, um, it becomes more difficult to feed on a nipple shield because it's not quite as reliable in milk production for uh, the baby. And if the baby's on the end of the nipple shield, it doesn't ask the breast to make the next feed as well. So it tends to drop the um, the uh, milk supply. So you've got to be really proactive if that happens and, and pump for a bit as well. But um, they are brilliant. And uh, in your head, you're breastfeeding, which is so much more important than anything else. And for the baby. Yeah. Um, but the cat, but, but the, the catch, don't use them in, before your milk's in. Please, no, please don't use them before your milk comes in because you will not have a milk supply if you're using a shield in those early days. There is not enough stimulation to get the milk supply going. So we do have mothers who bring them in or somehow are given them. Um, and in its really early days, and then you unfortunately will, will struggle to get a milk supply going if you use them before your milk is really in. So avoid them. I mean, we point. tend to introduce them when babies have been having bottles for a lot and then they go back to the breast you know, to fall back in love with the breast when they've had a bottle. We wouldn't use them an awful lot if the baby's on the breast and you're sore because actually that's putting a sticky plaster on the problem. What you need to do is uh, work out why you're sore and, and get uh, good breastfeeding positioning and attachment support so that we can try and get you to breastfeed without um, having pain because, um, you know, it just delays it. And what you're wanting to do is, is to try and get your positioning attachment absolutely tip top. But if you know if you've been giving lots of bottles or your baby's a bit premature, sometimes it's something that's introduced. I mean, sometimes we do use them when we're sore because it means you can breastfeed. But mm. what you should be doing is getting really good positioning and attachment support to um, to support that uh, alongside uh, using them and have it as a very short term thing. But many people breastfeed for a year with nipple shields. Yeah. Um, Martin has said, quick question, Amelia has been doing green poos, it's been going on for a few days, so I wondered if there's a reason for concern. She'd been seen by the GP and they weren't too concerned. How old is she now? Um, oh, Martin didn't working, say, yeah. didn't say and I can't remember. can't remember how old your baby is now. Um, it might be that they've had a cold or something, or yeah, have I've they seen. had any vaccinations, immunisation, sometimes that happens, or... Um, if you've uh, had lots of frequent feeds on the uh, nipple shields and not quite as far on or not as long feeds, that uh, they've got a little bit more full milk and not She's six weeks. As much. Six Thank weeks. you, Marzena. Um, so it might be that, um, you know, that, that uh, there's lots of milk there suddenly. Have you been doing lots and lots of small feeds and, and your milk production yeah. gone up a little bit? Uh, and are you draining your breasts really well with the nipple shields on? Uh, if that's not the case, I mean, you could go along somewhere like OBS and see if they could uh, support your position and attachment uh, and see if they can challenge the nipple shields with you to see uh, how you're getting on without them. And you can do that yourself as well. You can um, get your baby to feed with the nipple shield and then when the flow is going and they're really glugging and still really hungry, you can really whip the nipple shield up quickly. But also the other thing you can do um, if you want to get off them, you might not want to, um, is make a sandwich with your fingers. So you, you make a sandwich like that and you put your baby onto the breast with your fingers like that on the breast and hold it and hold it and hold it and hold it while your baby's suckling. So it, this feels like the hard plastic then. It makes the, the nipple feel really, really firm. And uh, we did it in clinic this morning and, and the little baby, she went on absolutely beautiful. Beautifully, Iris went on and she suckled for the first time without it and, and mum just held really nice and firmly for a bit and then let go eventually and the feeding carried on and it just sort of tricks them to thinking that the nipple shield's still there 
but that's the trick that you can try and use but you sort of whisk it off and in the same breath as your baby you put them back on again so they don't realize that it's been moved uh, and uh, keep trying it but you know challenge it and then go back to using it if they get upset always go back to default so they always get a present um Stephanie said that we've been combi feeding, so breastfeeding during the day and evening with a bottle of formula or express milk at night. We've been doing responsive bottle feeding. She's always seems to be hungry. Uh, she was weighed today and is 4.6 kilos. Wow. So, um, so I mean, maybe that she's just taking a big portion of her amount of milk in the evenings then. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, if everything else is going fine, I wouldn't worry about it. We say responsive, so keep going. Yeah. Um, if you're at work, you know, maybe she's catching up in the day. Yeah. At night when you're um, with her one-to-one, -one. if you're busy in the day, perhaps it's one-to-one -one time with your baby that, you know, she's picked up on. Yeah, they like, like having you to themselves. Um, Susan said, thank you. It was a tough eight weeks and I really persevered. I used nipple shields and then eventually without. I nearly gave up so many times. A few times he got so upset at the breast, but my husband was a great support and kept me calm. And finally, it worked. Uh, I've loved feeding him. I had twin girls now four years. They were ex exclusively breastfed with only a little bit of actual breastfeeding. So this journey has been lovely. Well Very done. Cathartic well you. done you. Yeah, That's so, so good. important. Uh, Marzena said that she's still pumping as well, one to two times a day to ensure she maintains her supply. Brilliant. So, um, Maxine's... It might just be a cold or something that your baby's yeah. got and it's just a bit off colour, but, um, you know, just make sure that, um, that, that you've got a really good latch. Yeah, she's come back again. No vaccination. She's been sneezing a little. Long feeds in the community team and they said attachment's good. Trying the sandwich and Amelia attaches, but then loses the latch and gets frustrated. So perhaps hold on for a bit longer. Yeah, but she's going to keep trying. Yeah. She's going to go back because yeah. that was further down. Um, I'm going to make sure I don't miss anyone. So we talked to Susan. Susan put hers on. And Stephanie, who's uh, doing a great job too. Uh, there was another one here. Oh, Maxine wrote, talking about the shields, Maxine wrote, best way to stop cracked nipples, question mark. Um, Positioning and attachment. <laughs> <laughs> Except making sure the latch is correct. The answer well, to everything. Yeah, I'm afraid it is. Because if you, can I borrow breath? I, I, I spent the morning doing this, talking to people about this. If you think of the baby's mouth and you think about the breast, if the nipple goes into the middle, this is what's happening. And you can see that nipple is getting really mm. squashed. The nipple can't cope with that. It shouldn't have a rasping tongue and a hard palate around it. If the baby goes on with the nipple at the top of its mouth, then if they, they use the tongue and they scoop it to the back of their mouth. And this bit is like a little soft cushion ready for the, for the nipple. And they do this and you can see the tongue is not anywhere near the nipple and that's how you don't get cracked nipples and that's why we are so sort of careful about position attachment and that we really work hard to make sure babies are going on well looking and they're just looking blue. for our fab picture it's gone missing it's gone missing so it must be there must somewhere. Be somewhere and it shows a baby is. so it shows the whole series it starts here we go best with me load of fun here so, yeah so you line your little your little baby up like that so that's the first picture so you're lining nose them to really nipple. nose to nipple and it's really exaggerated uh, as alex has already said so you're right you feel your baby's not going to get anywhere near the breast when you do that and then they stick their head back and the breast is lined up perfectly as alex has said so it just skims the gum ridge at the we'll top do it here as well it goes there yeah there yep and that gum ridge just takes the breast into the mouth so the nipple goes skimming over the roof of the mouth to the back of the throat and the chin hits the breast first so you know you really exaggerate it can you see that really exaggerated it's much more exaggerated there the chin really hits and can you see that that is so asymmetrical there's so much more areola at the top than at the visible at the bottom so it's it's really underneath the breast and they're scooping the breast into their mouth first and the nipple will follow over the roof of the mouth and then the baby goes onto the breast firmly like that and so you can't see much around but the nose is quite clear and your baby's comfortable on the breast with a big mouthful of breast and big full cheeks. And what you don't want is if that's the upper lip and that's the nipple you don't want a gap here you don't want the nipple here you want the nipple right up there so it's literally skimming. 
so important to get it right. And, you know, if you've got cracked nipples, it's because they've been rubbed. And that it's that rubbing, which is, uh, you know, on the hard palate, which is excruciating. And uh, it, it's millimetres just to tweak it to get it better. But once you do that, you say, I can't feel it anymore, then, you know, you won't go back to pain, painful feeds. So go and find somebody that can watch your positioning and attachment and support if you've got cracked nipples or sore nipples, because it makes my toes curl thinking about it. Um, you know, go and get some help. So Rosanna's just come back and said she's going to keep trying, and um, thank you. And Charlie has come back and she said, I've got PCOS and underactive th thyroid. Would I still be able to breastfeed? Will the flow be there? Well, can I suggest, Charlie, that if we don't know about you already, yeah. that you get your, you either contact us directly or you get your community midwife to contact us because what we're doing is seeing a lot, well, see, uh, we do telephone calls, we do telephone appointments. Um, for anybody who's got risks like just like yours yeah. um, of not producing enough milk. So can I suggest you either contact us directly um, and you can find our details on the hospital website if you look under OUH maternity feeding you'll find our details. Give us a call and we'll, we'll uh, arrange an antenatal appointment for you to talk about what's going on with you and how we can help you to maximise the milk that you do get. Yeah. Not all people who have PCOS or hyperthyroidism have problems, but enough do that it's worth us having a conversation. And um, the other ones that we, we do like to see are moms that have had implants yes. or have had breast reduction. Yeah. So if you've had any breast or chest surgery, um, you know, let us know because if the same, ring, ring up or get your midwife to refer and, you know, we will ask you why you've had it, you know, and, and a lot of people say, well, they have it for plastic, just for, you know, plastic surgery reasons that they want to enhance their breast, but you know, sometimes um, you don't grow a breast or one breast is much smaller than the other and the production at puberty isn't as good. And, you know, if your breasts haven't changed at all and, and it's not size so much as shape, mm -hmm. it's the lack of um, breast tissue. So it's a lack of um, ducts in your, um, not producing ducts in your breast that is the thing that's significant. So if you've had very little breast growth in puberty or you needed something like metformin to regulate periods and make breast growth, uh, when you're a teenager, we ought to be talking to you. If you've had breast surgery um, implants because um, your breast did not develop at all, uh, then, or one did and one didn't, then, we, you know, we need to talk to you. Uh, we need to talk to you anyway if you have got breast implants, and, and if you don't want to talk to us, you need to tell them when you've had your baby that you have, because we would suggest, you know, if you've had anything like that, that you have your baby weighed earlier, so on day three rather than day five is the first weight just to make sure that your baby's gaining enough. I ideally, lost too much, should we say. Ideally, these things come out when you have your booking appointments with the yeah. community midwives, that they actually, you know, they do ask you these sort of questions. Some and people they, do forget I, to say, though, yeah, don't they? Yeah, and they yeah. highlight it. But, you know, if you're listening to this and you think, actually, that I'm yeah. one of those, and I haven't got, I haven't been offered an appointment with the infant feeding team, then please do get in touch. self refer. Yeah. We're always happy to hear. And if you've had any sort of cancer treatment or anything like that, the same, you know, yeah. we will talk to you. And, and if you're on multiple medications for any reason, yes, do we'd like to know. Yeah. Because we can look at all the drugs very carefully and we can see if you're on multiple drugs, um, whether it's appropriate that you take all of those drugs when you're breastfeeding um, as, as a proportion, because sometimes it's okay to take one or two of them, but if you're on four or five of those medications and they're all slightly higher risk than some other drugs, then it might be that we can look at alternative medications for you um, and uh, make sure that you're safe to breastfeed. You know, There's not that many medications you can't take when you're breastfeeding, but some of them, if you're taking multiple drugs, it can be more high risk and there is more risk to babies. For instance, if you're on um, uh, sedative drugs or sleeping drugs or um, uh, you know things for um, bipolar or depression or something like that. Sometimes the drugs you're on can make your baby um, sleepy if you take a combination of them. So it's mm -hmm. it's appropriate that you um, contact us and talk us, you know, let us know what you're on if you want to have that conversation uh, and we can discuss it with your doctor. But thinking about medications, you know, there are many people who are taking things like Cicilopram or Sertraline 
these sort of medications are not contraindicated to breastfeeding. You can breastfeed and take them. And we know that mothers will sometimes choose without talking to someone to stop taking medications like that, either during pregnancy or during yeah. lactation. And we would highly recommend that you don't do that. We would highly recommend that you continue with any medications of that ilk and keep going. Um, and we will find a way around if, it, if there are any issues. But the standard ones like citalopram and sertraline are not an issue with breastfeeding and absolutely no reason for you to have to stop. Mm. It's much better that you're on your medications mm. that will make you feel good mm. than, uh, than not be on them in breastfeeding. So anyway, for a little flurry of another couple. Um, the lovely Leanne, little Lyra, has said, hi ladies. Yeah. Hope you're both well. Any tips for feeding a very noisy Lyra when we're out and about? She feeds so well at home, but when we're out, she's looking around, smiling at everyone and on and off the breast, leaving me to flash everyone. And then she's done me a lovely emoji like this. <laughs> <laughs> she's my sort of baby and she's Aww. smiling. That's so gorgeous. But it's it? so typical of these babies. How old is she now? Oh. Um, you know, if she's sort of getting up to four months, they sort of um, get really nosy and they rubber neck everything and every okay. noise they just pull off and have a look and then go back. She'll, she'll settle down. Once she knows what all those noises are, she'll settle down. It's just that uh, the world outside of mummy has now appeared and you've been the centre of her world and suddenly she's realised that there's a little bit more out there. She wants to know what everything is suddenly. Um, they do do it and then they go back to settling. But you might find that... Um, you know, you have to feed her in a, in a darkened room without the radio or television on for a bit as Just well. Just a little bit. <laughs> and try, try not to feed her out in public for a bit if it becomes a problem, oh, yeah. uh, so that she gets her calories in if it's really distracting. But I remember um, feed, going into a cafe and they were trying to, I was doing a filming thing for um, the NCT yeah. breastfeeding, but when my babies were little, so this is 30 years ago now, and uh, we went into a cafe and my son was about five months old when we did it. And we couldn't get any photos of him breastfeeding because he just wanted to watch everything and see everything and the coffee shop was noisy and, you know, it was, it was very difficult. So I know exactly what you're feeling. It's, <laughs> it's very distracting at that time. So uh, stick with it because it, yeah. will, it will move on. <laughs> It'll stop. Well, it's lovely to know to think about you feeding her though. It's so great because, you know, you've got over all your hurdles. Yeah, fabulous. Um, Charlotte's come on saying, how's our day been? Busy. <laughs> So, so yeah, we've been in clinic and we've done some teaching and we've been on the ward and oh, she's seven months, Lyra, seven wow, months. Wow, so that's great. She really is nosy, isn't she? Yeah, and Alicia's eighteen now. Yeah. Uh, and I've got one more. Charlie has said, "Where can you get breastfeeding support if you have been discharged from the midwife? Is there any drop-in sessions I can attend? Just want someone to check the position and help with showing other positions and match." as I'm getting a backache a lot. OBS, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support, and La Leche are a really good organisation and Abingdon Baby Cafe. All of those will be happy to give you a hand. Um, give them a call. Um, I think earlier, I think on Monday actually, OBS still had appointments for this week, which is quite unheard of. Mm. Um, uh, so, you know, they are getting quite booked up because it is appointment only, as is Abingdon Baby Cafe, but well worth it. They were all um, very well, you know, skilled people helping in those. So well, I think they were for a moment, didn't we? Okay, sorry about that. Phone. She just disappeared. Yeah, it's um, gone here. There we are. So, sorry about that. It's my phone trying to load a, um, an update. So, right. Well, I think we're there. Actually, it's um, three thirty-four. So lots of load, loads of brilliant questions. That was really fantastic and lots of different types of questions, which is nice. There's sort of a theme each week, but um, it's been really variable today, which is great. It's been helpful for newborns and for older babies as yeah. well, which is brilliant. The likes of Alicia at 18 months, and Lyra at, what was it, seven, seven months. months. And then we had uh, another one at nine months, eight months. And eight weeks, Susan's yeah. baby's eight weeks. So it's been lovely, real mix. And then yeah. Marcella's baby. So anyway, it's been lovely. Thank you very much, one and all. Keeps us all going and yeah. keeps other mums going, telling them your stories, which is really important. And I think like Susan's saying about what happened with feeding for her, I mean, that's so reassuring for other people. Yeah. That's so nice. Another so. question just come up now. Oh, let me have a peek. Where can I self-refer to see you? Um, contact us, give us a call. Um, our number is, well, you don't have to rush around and find a pen, but it's 572-950. But go on the website, go and have a look at the hospital websites. If you look at OUH, maternity feeding, you'll find all our contact details on the website. 
So um, we've got a lovely heart from uh, Leanne, which is lovely. So um, well yeah. done, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your questions. I think we're going to go. Yeah. Oh, it's me on my own next week. Naomi's in, on leave, so I'll be on my own. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like I have lots yeah. of holidays, I don't really. <laughs>